Here's an interesting little IBM PS2. It's been a while since I've made an IBM PS2 related video, so I thought I'd start up with one of the more interesting machines, as if they're if as if they weren't all interesting, from the PS2 lineup. This is the PS2E, and it was actually a development that came along fairly late in the lifetime of the IBM Personal System 2 computers. Its official model number is a 9533. And the idea behind this computer was supposed to be one of a couple of different things. Uh, in particular, it was supposed to be a very environmentally friendly, ultra-low power, and especially recyclable computer, long before anyone really cared to create such a thing. It has the name, sometimes it's referred to as the Pizza Box, because of its small size and form factor. And because of its small size and low power consumption, it has sometimes found use as a network router or a wireless access point or something like that, running a pared down operating system. Now, the machine, as with all PS2 models below 50, this machine has an ISA bus in it, 16-bit single slot. Now, it could have been ordered with nothing in the slot, a token ring adapter, an Ethernet card, or the four-slot PCMCIA or PC card adapter, which it seems that many of the machines were ordered with. And there's two slots in the back for your PC cards, and there's two slots in the front. And then over here is a floppy drive, which is actually a 1.44 megabyte drive as opposed to the later 2.88. However, the onboard floppy controller is capable of using a 2.88 megabyte drive, and you may steal one from certain ThinkPads, such as the ThinkPad 720, if yours happens not to work. Now, as with all other PS2s, or at least the very most of them, the major portions of disassembly can be accomplished without tools. For example, this little lever right here lifts up, and then you can pull the case off the machine. Now, it's kind of a tight fit, so I know I can't do it single-handed, but give me a moment here and I'll have the cover off. Taking the cover off reveals quite a bit more as you'd expect it to. There's the ISA slot and there's the single PCMCIA adapter. Underneath that you can kind of just barely make out the SIMs. You can see the system speaker right there which ironically for such a small system it's not a little squeaker can, it's an actual two, I'd say two inch speaker. The onboard video is the IBM XGA2 and those black lines that you see toward the bottom are actually the onboard video memory. I don't have a screwdriver handy, so I can't pull the PC card adapter. Over here you have the power supply, and if you put a compact flash card into an IDE adapter, this would be the perfect machine for silent computing because this power supply is completely fanless, has a whopping 24 watts worth of output on all the voltage rails combined, so it's a little bit easy to overload it. In fact, some people who have uh, put sound cards in these have reported that if theirs has an onboard amplifier and they don't disable it, the playback of a loud sound is enough to cause the uh, power supply to destabilize and hang the system. Now the PC card adapter is pretty average. It's uh, based on an Intel chipset of some kind or another. But it does have one unique feature, and, and if you've looked at this, you may have figured it out already. There's this set of locking solenoids on each of the two banks of card bays, and when a card is inserted, the adapter locks it in. Unfortunately, to make use of this requires special IBM software that doesn't work under, say, Windows 95 or Windows NT if you were going to run those things on this system because it was never released for those operating systems. Fortunately, the easy workaround is to simply unplug the connector, which although it's rather firmly seated, it is possible to remove it without breaking anything, and then the locking solenoids won't fire and trap your cards. Now, some of the system can be disassembled toollessly, like for example, this cage right here can be carefully lifted up and moved out of the way. Although if you do this, you want to be doubly sure to be careful of those ribbon cables because you can tear them and that will really, really, really ruin your day. You won't enjoy doing that. So if you take apart your own PS2E, be sure that you're very careful with some of the cables and stuff in here. Okay, so I told a little bit of a fib. You do need a little bit of uh, help from tools to undo one screw that holds this entire cage assembly in. But there you can see the floppy drive. 
the power supply and its connectors just to give you an idea of how small it is. That's my finger right next to it for scale. And at the bottom you can see the hard drive, which is a two and a half inch parallel ATA or IDE laptop hard drive. It needs to be less than 15 millimeters in height, but fortunately most modern drives are. Of course the machine has a 528 megabyte system BIOS capacity limit, so you'll need to use a disk manager to get the full capacity of a drive if you go beyond the 528 megabyte mark. This reveals a little bit more of the system board here, and you can see there's a mysterious connector here that looks like it would be for a surface mount 486 processor, something that IBM never produced for this thing. There are also other indications that maybe they intended to use a 486 um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is, but IBM made their own, they had their own rights to um, Intel's processors. They were able to produce them and fabricate them, and so they did, oftentimes with enhancements. And one of those processors was the 486 SLC, and its counterpart was the 486 DLC. Now the main difference between these two was that the SLC version was intended to be used on a 386 SX class board and had an internal 32-bit data bus while externally it was restricted to a 24-bit combined data and address bus. So the maximum memory in this system is limited to 16 megabytes. Anyway, the object with the brilliant gold heatsink on it is the 486 SLC2 microprocessor which operates at a clock rate of 50 megahertz. If you pull the math coprocessor socket out, very carefully I might add, you'll notice that there's a rather unique pin grid array socket underneath it. And what this was used for, this never saw any use in the PS2E of course, because the system was far too space constrained for it. Um, what goes here is a 486 SLC3 processor upgrade. Now, although the model the Model E never made any use of this. The Model 56, 57, and maybe some others did as well. This board also shows up, very rarely I might add, in some IBM PS2 Model 35 and 40 computers. These are the ultra-rare 9535 and 9540 models, which were ordinarily just 85 series or non-premium line models. But there you have it, basically a complete walkthrough of the IBM PS2 Model E. Now I'm running kind of short on time and this machine was sitting in unheated storage so I'm not going to power it up right now. I'll power it up at a later date and let you see a video of it starting up. Anyway, thank you for watching.